I'm Emily Jashinsky. I'm Josh Hammond. I'm Rachel Bovard. And I'm Ben Weingarten. And this is NatCon Squad, where common good and common sense meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the Edmund Burke Foundation, the home for national conservatism. Subscribe now on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. As usual, we have a packed show and we're covering a lot of ground. So we'll be talking about why America no longer trusts the quote, experts. Um, That's a a dubious label these days. We'll be talking about why Twitter uh, has suspended a big tech watchdog. We'll talk about the Senate's half-hearted approach to taking on China. And we'll also talk about how the New York Times was sort of disturbed to see a very galling display of patriotism in the form of American flags. But on that note, I'll kick it over to Josh to start us off with a conversation about why America no longer trusts the so-called experts. Yeah, thanks, Emily. So I feel like this is one of kind of like the great recurring themes of that kind of squad. I mean, it's kind of one of our late motifs, if you will, is kind of the ever widening chasm between we the people and the ruling class that yearns to subjugate us and kind of get us out of society and kind of cow us into submission. But it really kind of was only kind of accentuated, and I think really exacerbated by a recent FOIA requests from BuzzFeed and the Washington Post. With respect to Anthony Fauci, you know, if you're paying attention to the news, you've probably seen this. It's kind of been, uh, at least the news that I follow, I can't speak obviously necessarily for MSNBC or New York Times. I'm not sure if they're covering this, but certainly the news that I follow seems to be really kind of all over this story. And in particular, obviously, um, you know, this tale to an extent really does not even need to be kind of recounted. We're all, we, we quite literally have just lived it, um, starting in, uh, you know, mid-March of 2020, obviously, um, you know, what we, what we were sold as and what by death count, um, I, don't, I don't want to downplay it, almost assuredly is, of course, um, the worst pandemic in a century. Um, and we effectively just uh, shut down and like we had to wear masks, obviously, every time we left the house, uh, there were society wide lockdowns. Um, I was living in Texas at the time. I remember when Greg Abbott kind of first quote unquote opened up Texas on May 1st of last year, it was like a big kind of victory and then it shut down for- shortly thereafter. So we've kind of just lived this through the problem, of course, um, that the listeners don't necessarily need to be up to date on because we again have lived this is that the CDC, uh, the NIH, and all the kind of various other government mandarins and bureaucrats have been all over the map on this. They have been here, there, everywhere, while nonetheless always seeming to err on the side of what, from my perspective, I think a lot of people's perspective, is fairly draconian overreaction for a virus that has somewhere between like a 98 to 99, possibly over higher than 99% recovery rate. Um, On a personal note, I had the virus actually last June, fairly early on, and uh, I lost my sense of smell and taste for a couple of weeks, which was not particularly pleasant. But other than that, it really wasn't debilitating. I was still working perfectly normal hours. But in any event, these kind of go back to what we're talking about. The FOIA request that BuzzFeed and the Washington Post unveiled specifically details some emails from Anthony Fauci, and some of them are quite damning. Um, There are some emails that he uh, sent in February 2020. Again, this is barely before uh, the lockdowns and the mask hysteria started uh, just a month later, that he's sending to former Obama Secretary of Health and Human Services, Sylvia Burwell. And some of the emails, I'm just going to read from some of it. Uh, Dr. Fauci is explaining, he says, the store-bought face masks are, quote, really for infected people to prevent them from spreading infection to people who are not infected, rather than protecting uninfected people from acquiring infection. Furthermore, in this email, he added, quote, typical masks you buy in the drugstore is not really effective in keeping out the virus, which is small enough to pass through material. Um, So query whether that email is itself even kind of internally reconcilable. It seems kind of internally kind of hypocritical and contradictory. But the CDC and Fauci and and Deborah Burks and kind of the rest of the Trump era coronavirus task force um, and, and obviously the, the Biden era coronavirus task force for that marriage, um, it has just been all over the map on these issues. They have told us on the one hand that, that, that the face masks prevent, prevent us. Then later in 2020, they, 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 they flipped on this um, with respect to kind of particles or droplets, uh, the, the aerosol. There's been, they've been all over the map on this. There's been a lot of studies that, uh, frankly, that have shown um, or really cast serious doubt upon the efficacy of anything other than than the K95, the absolute top tier face masks. Um, Jordan Schachtel, you know, who runs a very popular kind of Substack, largely devoted to this, I think, has kind of done yeoman's work and kind of casting doubt upon the preferred narrative on a lot of this. But to kind of escape from the particulars and kind of get to the higher level narrative here, 
the the point here is that we just basically shut down for a year okay we shot our own economy in the foot we shot our own livelihoods in the foot we stopped going to church we stopped going to synagogue we stopped going to in-person school these children will never get this year back of lost in-person learning this was a huge huge blow that we've dealt ourselves and hold aside for a second the geopolitical ramifications with respect to the chinese communist party and the wuhan lab and all that and focus on the domestic here what seems from my perspective what happened was, and you see this kind of when a more specific version in, in Michigan, of course, with Governor Whitmer, California with Gavin Newsom, New York with Andrew Cuomo. This was an elite power grab. It is now further than ever, from my perspective, that this was an elite power grab by a cabal of experts in name only who are not actually expert, who are basically making it up as they go along. And they effectively took us along for the ride. Um, and, you know, it, it's really kind of harrowing and disconcerting to kind of look at that in retrospect. I mean, we literally just lived this out. Um, but I, I mean, I guess I'll, you know, I'll kick it over to the panel on this. I mean, is it as bad as I am making it out to be? Um, or am I kind of being hyperbolic and exaggerating the, the divide between kind of the COVID era ruling class and we the people? It seems, it, it seems like this problem as of now, cannot possibly get any worse, the divide that is between kind of the normal median American citizen and our ruling class. So I have like three thoughts about this. I find these emails incredibly disturbing, but before I can even get to the emails, I just want to point out here that, you know, as we talk about so many times, our institutions generally have failed. And the fact that it was BuzzFeed that had to do the basic amount of journalism required here. Because to be clear, BuzzFeed is not a great actor in this space. And what we're talking about is a FOIA request, which is like the baseline equivalent of having a pulse in journalism to make a FOIA request on this like very significant high profile issue. And it was freaking BuzzFeed that had to do this. <laughs> I would also know it was Vanity Fair that broke the story, like some other like uh, COVID, oh, the COVID critical story about how the State Department was messaged or supposed to be messaging about the lab leak. Like again, not a paragon of journalism. So all, all our Pulitzer Prize winning outlets I think should be ashamed. But second, I think that this goes to like this issue that bedeviled I think the elites and our elite institutions during the Trump years that I think unmasked them for who they are, which is you know not representative of our democracy generally, but like perpetuating this noble lie right, of like whatever it is that they decide must be the right answer. So they're not telling us the truth, they're telling us what they think is in service of democracy, however they define it. And I think that that's incredibly damaging, not only to, to what you point out as people's faith in the institutions, but going forward, I think we can confidently say at this point, or at least from where I sit, people are not going to trust their public health institutions anymore. And that is going to have an extremely deleterious effect God forbid we ever face a pandemic again. And this, I think, just goes back to this idea that like, I actually think the American public would have tolerated a certain amount of uncertainty around these questions because what you get in those Fauci emails is uncertainty. You know, I don't, you know, the, it might've been released from a lab, I don't know. Masks, probably not useful. Are COVID, or people infected with COVID immune? What you get is the uncertainty around a novel virus. The public would have accepted that, I think, if it was genuine and honestly delivered. But instead, we got this like false sense of epistemic certainty, which was wrong, which we now know was wrong. And, and I think so many people feel lied to. So uh, maybe that was more of a rant than a comment, but I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> no, I, I think that was more of a rant than a comment, but I think it was a very, a very justified rant, because in this case, I don't think people realize that this is not just an abstract sort of partisan talking point. The Fauci thing has super immediate implications and consequences. As Rachel said, God forbid we have another pandemic come our way. Listen, we didn't earn time off from pandemics. Pandemics don't care that we just went through a pandemic. Something could happen at any moment, right? Like something could turn into a similarly disastrous situation. And the public, I don't think Fauci realizes, is so primed right now to tune absolutely everything out. And that will be lasting. Things change, right? People have, qu ha have short political memories. But at the same time, this is going to have, I think, a very, very enduring impact or an enduring um, footprint on our country's level of institutional trust in the same way similar like major historic events shape the way that we look at things. The Fauci emails um, are just a good example of why going forward people are going to be like this is um, you know you told us to wear masks you told us not to wear masks you said we were 
too dumb to hear given information at a given time. And Fauci was trying, you know, in his mind, he's trying to, to do what he thinks is what is in the interest of the public, which is keeping information from the public and telling the public one thing um, when they should be doing something else. And uh, then, you know, saying that falls under the umbrella of science. I don't think he realizes, I, I don't think he has any idea exactly how bad that is going to be going forward. Well, in my view, the trust the science people have shown themselves to be total frauds and that they prioritize politics and preserving the institutions and their own personal reputations above all else. In other words, they've shown themselves to be the archetype of the government bureaucrat on the merits as a consequence of these policies that have been imposed upon us. This should have served as the death knell for progressivism in the traditional sense of enlightened technocrats making decisions for the hapless public. Uh, which simply isn't equipped to make such massive decisions for themselves. And I think on, on every single layer, this is even worse, I think, Josh, than you lay out for a couple of reasons. First, in terms of the long-term costs to liberty and justice that have transpired as a consequence of the way this has played out at the state and local and federal levels as well. And then the precedent that was set. Because if you think this is going to be the last lockdown, I'm very concerned that it won't necessarily be. Because in the name of science and public health, the government could justify at all levels a whole range of draconian measures uh, now that this genie is out of the bottle. So I think the, the consequences for it are dramatic if the American people don't take as the, as the lesson of this that the people who claim purport to be experts actually have shown themselves to be political and nothing more than that. And they're political without actually representing us because they are unelected bureaucrats in their positions of power uh, for years on end. And we have no check on them, unfortunately. And so this should be the death knell of the administrative state in reality. Unfortunately, I fear that this may mean that people put even more faith in the government down the road. But that's why it's our job to explain in a sober, and, and very measured and reasoned fashion at every single level, how much of a political calamity this is on top of the geopolitical. Yeah, so just to very quickly wrap up on this and then kick it right back to Ben for our next segment here. It, the, the administrative state actually is kind of where I'm focusing right now. I'm actually gonna be genuinely curious to see whether there are kind of more anti-administrative state trends that develop after this. It's coming at a very interesting time though, because especially in kind of the more kind of common good conservative oriented world, if you will, um, folks like Professor Adrian Vermeil of Harvard are increasingly making aggressively pro-administrative state arguments. So um, I, I come from a kind of a more traditional anti-administrative anti state view, or at least very skeptical administrative state power. So I'll be curious to watch those trends play out as well. But uh, Ben, on that note, let's kick it right back to you to talk about um, not just kind of our public sector ruling class, but kind of our uh, petty Silicon Valley centric private sector ruling class. Yeah, I've, I've referred to big tech as an auxiliary of the administrative state, if not a part of the administrative state, uh, at least de facto, if not really de jour at this point. And I'm way overdue to actually write that up, but stay tuned on that. Uh, this week, we saw the latest example of the fact that the extension of the administrative state in big tech simply cannot tolerate dissent on any issue that matters, large and small, if not completely trivial. Uh, and so we saw Mike Davis the head of the Internet Accountability Project. And, and we should state up front that both Josh and Rachel are affiliated with that project. And I've spoken to Mike Davis a few times on a personal level as well. So we're probably all compromised in covering this topic. But nevertheless, we can, we can take this individual example and expand it to the much broader issue at play here. Uh, he was suspended or at least had some features temporarily revoked on Twitter because he had the temerity, the absolute gall to essentially comment on the fact that it was absurd that a former Trump administration official, Will Upton, had tweeted comparing Brian Stelter of CNN to a character in the Quentin Tarantino movie Pulp Fiction. We don't need to go into the specifics of the character with whom he was compared, uh, but it was a laughable comparison. Will Upton saw himself gulagged on Twitter as a consequence of it. He ultimately got his features back, but Mike Davis got in trouble for simply defending the fact uh, that he made this comparison and pointing out the absurdity of Twitter revoking these features as a consequence of it. Ultimately, Mike Davis himself would be reinstated. Uh, he put out a statement, I'll read it in part here in response to it, in which he said, and I quote, Twitter sent me to Twitter jail for 12 hours starting last night, purportedly for sending a tweet defending Will Upton, a big tech critic and former Trump administration official. The real reason that Twitter suspended my account is because 
I lead a high profile advocacy organization, high profile advocacy organizations that are taking on big tech monopolists, Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Twitter, desperate and flailing big media outlets like CNN and their woke cancel culture nonsense, of which both CNN and Twitter are two of the worst proponents, enablers, and enforcers. I would say, and, and that's the end of the quote there, he also goes on to talk about the fact that this shows, once again, the asinine fact uh, that Twitter and many other big tech companies as well have completely taken advantage of their Section 230 privileges and immunities. And I would argue, as we've talked about before on this show, completely violate the spirit, obviously, of Section 230, which is supposed to be about free and open discourse, if not the letter of it as well, and take advantage of those protections, which have given them, in effect, monopolistic positions in controlling the public square. What, what I think about this whole episode, and then I'll turn it over to others, perhaps Rachel to talk about the antitrust elements perhaps of this and Josh on IAP generally uh, and beyond is this is something that's so trivial. It's a guy on CNN, their so-called media critic, Reliable Sources, which is the most ironic name for a show I've ever heard of, who of course, Brian Stelter gets attacked in media all the time by folks. He's a public figure, obviously. And of course it's fair game to criticize him and, and use satire and the like in attacking him, just like we all can get attacked on Twitter and social media uh, with total impunity as well. Why would Twitter go after multiple individuals over something as trivial as this? And I think it shows that from issues big, like for example, the president of the United States account, uh, or to questions regarding the coronavirus that are completely legitimate, including lab leak, obviously, has become real, as has become clear lately, down to something like this, making a comparison of a public figure to someone in a, mo a movie character, big tech simply cannot allow anyone who is among the benighted elites in our country to be attacked or any issues that are considered sacred issues to be explored at any great depth. And so once again, this shows that the purportedly free and open online public square simply does not exist. That, but maybe perhaps that our elites are actually scared and they really need to silence anyone and everyone who dares run afoul of the party line on almost any issue or topic. And maybe ultimately this will destroy the legitimacy of big tech, or maybe as in her last segment, uh, our public figures, our elites at the commanding heights will just continue to try and usurp more and more power until someone stands up to them. So with that, I'll turn it over to the group for uh, impressions about this particular episode or how to extrapolate to, to broader issues around it. Well, I think something you touched on at the end is one of the most important points here, really one of the most insidious elements, I think, of big tech, which is that increasingly it is working hand in glove with one party to, you know, censor or mollify or block criticism of public figures. This is not the first time we've seen this. Um, you know, obviously the most infamous example is all the platforms banning the Hunter Biden New York Post story because it was critical of Hunter Biden. There was no other reason. Right. Twitter actually had to make up a policy and then retroactively apply it. That, that's how stupid the whole situation was. But we've seen this again. We saw it recently. Again, the poor New York Post got censored when they published a story about a Black Lives Matter co-founder purchasing four separate homes. And, you know, no personal details were in that story. They claim Facebook claimed it violated their you know, personal information policy where it had no personal details, didn't even say or identify all the cities in which homes were purchased. And I'm sorry, Barack Obama buys a house in Hawaii and we're allowed to comment on that, but we're not allowed to comment on, you know, this Marxist uh, purchasing four homes in, in, in clear violation of her, her own ideology that she wants to enforce on the rest of us. So I really do think it's this ability to shield public figures from criticism and the, the absolute uh, double standard that they have for it. I wanna point out that, you know, Will Upton gets blocked for making fun of Brian Stelter when Rand Paul's, you know, attack by his neighbor is routinely celebrated by, you know, leading Twitter accounts. You know, violence against a sitting politician is celebrated and encouraged, you know, and his people tweet celebrate his neighbor for attacking him and breaking six of his ribs. Yeah, totally fine on social media. So, so much of this, I think, gets to the heart of our public discourse. These companies, I think, are a threat, you know, have been a threat to speech for years now, but I think more and more are a threat to our ability to hold our public officials accountable to engage in the dissent that is the hallmark of a robust public process. And I think that is what a there's a really insidious threat to our self-government when that is the case. Yeah, I'm really happy that Rachel mentioned the Hunter Biden New York Post uh, kerfuffle, if we can call it that. Um, 
I, that was kind of my impetus actually to uh, text Mike Davis, the the star of this particular segment, to basically say that I want to get involved with IAP. I mean, uh, I, I refer to that as a big text Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, I mean, I, 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 months later, I still cannot believe that that happened. Um, we are literally eight months after the fact now. And it's for two and a half weeks, less than a month before a massive presidential election, the nation's oldest continually operating daily newspaper, the fourth largest newspaper by circulation in America, founded by no less than Alexander Hamilton himself, was locked out of its own Twitter account for reporting on the troubled son of a presidential candidate based on reporting that to this day has not been questioned, denied, fact-checked, or anything of that nature. It is an unbelievable story. Um, so look, I mean, like Rachel said, I mean, the underlying tweet here, I mean, was like Will Upton, like making fun of Brian Stelzer. I mean, are, are you like, what like, like, what like parody or like satire world are we living in where like, this is like amounting to like a, to like a, to a Twitter ban? I mean, like, look, what Ben said about big tech is exactly right. The phrase that I use, I think in my column last week about Fauci and the ruling class, I refer to uh, big tech as, um, I think it was a quote, like, quote uh, the ruling classes, private sector enforcement arms, I think what I call them. That's basically what they exist for. They all, they are an, an auxiliary. They are kind of an appendage of the ruling class. They, they exist to kind of gatekeep, to promote the narrative, this, to, to censor those that they don't like. These companies are, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Rachel um, published a great piece for, for me in Newsweek last week that was kind of um, reflecting on this recent symposium that the American Compass Group Hosted on um, kind of kind of just thinking about other ways um, that the technology, uh, the digital revolution, is kind of an increasing uh, increasingly large threat to uh, our the, the way American way of life, frankly. And the reality is, like, we are going to confront these companies, or we are effectively going to get eaten up by them. Um, and uh, we really just increasingly don't have a choice there. Um, I'm amused that my good friend Mike Davis um, has gotten himself Twitter banned uh, yet again, um, and then kind of uh, uh, went, went out of his way to promote it, as, as, as my good friend Mike is known to do. But um, the story here, despite the, this, despite the humor, the broader story is not so funny. It's actually quite serious. You know, it, it reminds me of a conversation. Um, I, Rachel, I can't remember if it was you and I that were talking about this yesterday, but wondering if, you know, we could go back and rewind the clock and help Twitter and Facebook, like, think about what their speech rules would be for these platforms. This entire story reminds me of, like, how foolish they were to start trying to get into this game in the first place, because now they're going to have their own conflicts of interest increasingly implicated as they ban people that criticize them. And if they had just made life easier for themselves and implemented sort of a free speech, free speech maximalist approach approach to all of this instead of trying to placate the social justice mob on the left that is not representative more broadly of the population and is just loud and annoying but only causes headaches to the extent that corporate executives and their suite their c-suites let them um, if they had just not cowed and listened to that group and not hired them and tolerated their nonsense in their own ranks um, you know, I don't think we would be in these situations today where they're having to draw lines and now they're going to start trying to draw lines around people who criticize them, right? Like it's just such a mess and it didn't have to be. It never had to be like this. You just had to have a normal approach to free speech, to a maximalist free speech, which is, um, you know, a, a sort of we know we've run this experiment. It's the right way to approach debate and expression in this country. It helps sharpen bad ideas. It helps um, elevate good ideas. And if they had just taken that, that approach, they wouldn't have to get into these thorny, thorny issues that are increasingly going to hurt them um, and be a problem. So with that, I think, Ben, do you have one more thing you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to, first of all, quickly, Mike Davis's offending tweet was, Dear Twitter Safety, you really put big tech critic Will Upton in Twitter jail for comparing CNN's Brian Stelter to The Gimp in Pulp Fiction? I'd be very upset if I were The Gimp as well, but, you know, The Gimp's a fictional character, right? Must have been a fake compliment, uh, complaint. So leave aside the hilarity of that tweet for a second. Mike Davis was punished for violating our rules against hateful conduct. 
Hate speech is an alien concept in America. It has no place in our legal doctrine or the historical legacy of speech, which we ended up uh, essentially instilling in th this American project here. And the fact that big tech does impose these standards of hate speech essentially means imposing an a wholly alien standard of speech to the American system. We've talked about Facebook's oversight board having individuals on it representing many foreign nations and not America. This once again reflects the imposition of non-American, if not anti-American standards of speech on American citizens. And that's a shameful fact and a disgrace. Um, Rachel, it's your turn to bum us out. <laughs> <laughs> My role on the show. Although I will say the last thing I wanna mention about Twitter is like, what did you have to put into the algorithm to flag a, a insults about the GIMP? Like, <laughs> <laughs> or if that was like a person, I want to know who that person was. Anyway. They flagged um, GIMP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somehow that made it in the algorithm, which is stupid. Anyway. So yes, uh, the Senate actually did something this week, which is unusual. Uh, as we know, the Senate, the laziest institution in America, actually passed a bill. And um, I wanted to call this segment, the Senate half-heartedly takes on China because there was some heart to it, right? I want to say like that there's pros and cons to their approach. And I think the pro is that there was an approach at all. Um, the, the threat from China uh, geopolitically, but I, I would also say geoeconomically has been growing for years. And institutionally as a country, we just have not responded to it. And so I am encouraged to see, I think some recognition of this fact and a willingness by some politicians to take it on. Now, um, I do think in the bill that the Senate passed, which passed the Senate this week with 68 votes, um, was somewhat of a, of a vindication of Donald Trump. No one is saying that, but I do think that the Senate's recognition of the fact that Trump was actually right about critical supply chains, that maybe the semiconductor industry in America shouldn't be you know, going over to China. All of these things that Trump said and was roundly mocked for even on the right, I think this was a little bit of a vindication of that. But the second issue that I really wanna bring up is how much work remains to be done because I do think that this bill was important but flawed um, and flawed in some really critical ways. Um, one is just the sausage making process itself. So little passes the Senate at all that this, this package became a ride along for so many other things. Um, Rand Paul, as he often does, uh, took to the Senate floor with a huge list of, of things that the National Science Foundation continues to fund, uh, including the cocaine habits of quail. And you know we're, we're funding this institution again into the billions you know, unlikely to get a ton of, of strategic results. But a couple of other things that popped out to me in this in this legislation um, that I wanted to mention briefly is that, you know, there was a $10 billion earmark to Amazon included in this legislation, um, 80 billion for specific biotechnology research without any prohibition on creating or destroying human embryos or using aborted fetal tissue, or even any prohibition against using that research money to create human and animal chimeras. Um, but then more broadly, I think the point here is that it doesn't actually address, I think, the underlying issues with our relationship with China. Because yes, part of this is an innovation question and so and a lot of the funds are designed around you know, competing in these high-tech areas like high-tech physics and, and artificial intelligence. But far more broadly than that, we have an economic posture problem with China. China has used our free market against us. Uh, and by that, I mean, they've infiltrated our market with their own companies and we treat them as normal private actors when they are just with their arms of the state. They are arms of the Chinese state and we have no way to distinguish with our market economics in this way. Trump tried to ban TikTok for this reason and you saw the right go up in arms and saying you can't ban a private company. The FCC tried to address the threat of Huawei and was given the same talking point. So that's a critical area that we haven't addressed. I think we have not addressed the Chinese infiltration of our universities and the corruption of our university professors and students. Um, in addition, our J-1 visa system, the student visa system has been used against us multiple prosecutions to the Department of Justice for professors and students coming in and engaging in espionage. And finally, we don't even deal with the fact in this legislation or generally that we fund a lot of high tech research in the private sector as well with zero prohibitions on what those companies then go do with it. I think I've mentioned this example on this show before, but we fund you know, Google to do artificial intelligence research. Well, Google's just opened an AI office in Beijing. So we are funding our, our, our you know, supposedly tech, US-based tech champions who then turn around and sell that information to the highest bidder because they want access to the Chinese market. So again, short story, I'm glad to see people taking this threat seriously. I think this was a distinctly flawed approach. Uh, and I hope that the Senate and the country, I think, 
um, and can can more fully address what I see as a, as a much more comprehensive threat. Hit me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that it's important that we're getting the ball rolling in the, in the, in the right direction here. Um, I mean, the devil is always in the details, especially when we're talking about these massive bills. Um, I saw Senator Hawley vote against it. I thought his reasons were um, at, at least moderately persuasive, um, possibly even more persuasive than that. I mean, he obviously would have gone further as far as kind of disclosures and requirements and um the, he wants to put like a 100 tariff on items coming in from xinjiang province which of course is intuitive and makes great sense to me so you know look uh any, any time we're talking about like a bipartisan bill of this nature and i don't remember the exact roll call count but it was it was, it was like 65 35 to 70 30 something along those lines right okay so anytime you're going to get like a thoroughly bipartisan bill that kind of very easily clears a filibuster there's probably going to be a lot of bad stuff in there that you know i <laughs> as rachel knows better than anyone is as, as all as a veteran of all of our various DC wars on, on Capitol Hill. Um, there's a, a it's kind of baked into the equation that like a, a large bill of this uh, of this measure that both entails kind of a, a, a decently large to not very large price tag in addition to kind of a substantively kind of sprawling wide range measure is going to include a lot of crap. It's going to include a lot of bad stuff in this. But it's kind of like a paradigm shifting kind of Overton window shifting move. Um, this is one of the, at the end of the day, it's, it still is one of the more substantial, um, you know, industrial policy-esque bills um, that, that is that is getting serious attention to counter the rise of China in a very long time. Um, you know, and it wasn't that long ago, obviously, it was 2001, I think, right, that China ascended to the WTO, to the World Trade Organization. It was kind of, um, you know, at the time it was flaunted, of course, by, by uh, partisans of, of both political parties. You had Joe Biden on the, on, on the Democratic side of the ILB, who was then one of like, the leading proponents of China's ascendance to WTO. Uh, the Bush administration certainly supported it on kind of classic kind of Nixon goes to China, kind of free trade liberalization grounds. So it's kind of like a, to, not to get so, so lost in kind of the specifics, I think just taking like a slightly kind of higher view here, I'm encouraged to see that people are increasingly talking about this along the lines of the debate that I want to see it being talked about, um, along the lines of what, you know, what American Affairs Journal has been writing for years about kind of, um, you know, the, the reshoring imperative and supply chains and competing with China. I mean, the Chinese issue, obviously, uh, we, ne we can never do it justice. It is so complex and it affects literally everything in our lives. There's a currency manipulation, there's intellectual property theft galore. I mean, there's private corporations that kowtow as far as kind of like changing words with respect to t Tibet and Taiwan and Hong Kong on like the Mercedes Benz and Nike websites, whatever. I mean, it, this is a very, 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 deeply complex, intricate issue. It is obviously the issue of our time, and we're not going to necessarily get it right on the first try. Um, and to be clear, I'm not kind of advocating trial uh, trial and error, kind of baptism by fire when we're talking about bills with the price tag of this. Uh, but you know, I'm trying to kind of take a silver lining here, and I do think it's important that the conversation is shifting kind of a industrial policy centric kind of let's actually get the government involved to kind of you know incentivize kind of a, a more confrontational approach to China perspective. I'll be quick and I'll just say, I think Josh made a really good point. Anytime something passes on a solidly bipartisan basis, mm -hmm. it's going to be larded up with bad stuff. And that is especially doubly true when it comes to a bill that is focused on China, um, where basically our entire economy is uh, inextricably intertwined. Hopefully it's not inextricable, um, but is intertwined nonetheless. So on that point, all I'll say is, and my light just went off in my office because it's on an mm -hmm. auto timer. So if you're watching and not listening, that's what that was. Um, but, you know, the, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. That's absolutely true. And so I think purists on both sides need to have sort of realistic expectations about what can and will pass and should be passed in the in the Senate and through our Congress and be signed into law. I get that 100%. I think that's totally true. It's important to keep in mind that said, um, it is good, as I think the coalition of senators, Republican senators, Holly Rubio, who voted against this bill, it, it's important to continue to push the uh, sort of Washington establishment, push them to be better on these issues. Um, don't cave if something is going to have a net negative effect. Um, and sort of making that final assessment of net positive or net negative, it's not an easy cost benefit analysis to perform, but I think it is still important not just to, you know, not just to say, uh, well, we kind of did it um, and this is the best we can do. I think we can do better as public opinion turns the more and more we learn about what's happening in Xinjiang, um, the more and more we 
learn about what happened in the early days of the pandemic. So with that, I'll toss it over to you, Ben. Yeah, I mean, as as you all, and I'm sure listeners and viewers can imagine, uh, I would like a much stronger bill, and I would probably side with the Republican senators who voted against it and on similar grounds as well. Uh, I think we, we can take heart, I guess, at least rhetorically in the direction that the bill goes and implicitly uh, what it shows that our purported representatives understand about the size, scope, and nature of the threat posed by communist China. It is worth saying, however, that in both proclamations and also an execution, China has been preparing for decoupling de facto, if not in actuality, for several years now. And you see this in the rhetoric of their leaders. You see this in the policies as well. So we ought to keep that in the back of our minds as we see the U.S. more slowly adjust to rapidly changing conditions. I still think at the end of the day, uh, there has to be a broad acceptance among our political elites and acknowledgement and then actions taken that might actually lead to short term perceived at least economic pain in this country that communist China is engaged in a whole of government, whole of society effort to be the dominant world power, period, full stop. And that means an imperialist agenda. It means an aggressive and assertive agenda. It means a no holds barred effort to achieve it. And I don't know that this bill necessarily recognizes in whole, the size, scope, and nature of that threat, and just how far the Chinese Communist Party, led by General Secretary Xi, is willing to go to achieve it. And this is to say nothing of the fact that, as I've written about at length before, and probably discussed in this forum as well several times, still the executive branch has significantly more power ultimately than the legislative branch when it comes to combating the Chinese Communist Party. And I think the executive branch, unfortunately, is going to prove to be out to lunch. Let's see what happens if China makes a move on Taiwan. That will be a real test. Let's see what happens when our political leaders say universities are no longer allowed to take any money even remotely associated with the Chinese Communist Party. When our, when our companies uh, need to be totally divested of Chinese Communist Party linked entities, and the like. So, you know, I, I obviously want to see something significantly more robust and hard line with respect to the CCP, because that's how I view the size, scope and nature of the threat. And I hope our political class will get to that point. But the other side in this instance has a several decade head start on us. And, and we should take that very seriously. Well, you know, that wasn't such a bummer. Uh, after all, there's some good news wrapped up into mm -hmm. all of this. What I want to talk about today, I, I don't think is good news, uh, but there may be also some sort of good embedded in the response to it. Now, C uh, MSNBC contributor, I should say, Mara Gay, who is a member of the powerful New York Times editorial board, was on and Miss NBC yesterday, and she shared this um, really vivid and troubling anecdote. Um, she said, quote, I was on Long Island this weekend visiting a really dear friend, and I was really disturbed. I saw, you know, dozens and dozens of pickup trucks with expletives against Joe Biden on the back of them, Trump flags, and in some cases, just dozens of American flags, which is also just disturbing. Essentially, the message was clear. This is my country. This is not your country. I own this. Now, the New York Times editorial board put out a statement yesterday claiming Gay had been taken out of context, which, as you can see, is ridiculous because I just read the full quote in context. And no matter what framework or construction you put on that, it's bad. She claims that she was saying Trump has politicized the American flag. Even if that's true, it's again a false argument. It's representative of the left's belief that they should blame or that conservatives or the right is always to blame for causing the culture war. It's Trump who politicized the American flag. It's Trump who politicized the NFL, not Kaepernick who took a knee in the name of politics and social justice, which is a politically charged issue during the broadcasts. It's always Trump's fault. It's always conservatives fault for the culture war that the left is waging. So even if that very generous construction on what she said is accurate, it's still a pretty, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use her own word, disturbing situation. What she's really disturbed by is the American people. Um, at the end of the day, she's sort of like aghast that people would have these um, very untasteful expletive signs against Joe Biden. Listen, if you get out of um, Manhattan and you go into the rest of the country, I'm sorry, 
I wouldn't have a sign like that, but it's completely common. And it's a normal expression of the frustration that everyday people in this country have with their political re- political leaders. Let's not pretend there weren't resistance people who had the same thing with Trump. If you walk around DC, it says F Trump everywhere. It's on every street lamp. There's someone has graffitied F Trump, F Ivanka. It's everywhere. Um, some of that's maybe been cleaned up recently, but mm, not all of it. So I want to get your guys' take. I mean, I think this is a really, um, I don't think this is a totally new perspective among our sort of progressive elite class. I think they sort of have always had the simmering contempt for the strangers in their own country who they don't like. They can't totally put their finger on their dislike. There's just something um, about them that is de classe, um, and they wouldn't necessarily think of it in that terms, but I think viscerally that's where it comes from. And in this case, it has sort of infected Mara, Gaines Bray to, Mara Gay's brain to the point where she doesn't want to see American flags because they feel like a threat. They feel like a racial threat. The American flag feels like a racial, not the Confederate flag. That's a completely different conversation. The American flag itself. So let me toss it open to the group. You know, I was thinking about this actually literally last night. We're recording this on Wednesday. Um, so last night was Tuesday. Uh, I'm, I'm here in Denver. I went to game five of the uh, Colorado Avalanche versus Las Vegas Golden Knights uh, NHL playoff series. Um, the girlfriend's from Vegas. She's a huge hockey fan, anniversary gift, et cetera. But during the singing of the national anthem, I literally, like, I was thinking about this. I was literally, I was looking around. I was trying to see, this is Denver, okay? Like Colorado is a pretty solidly blue state at this point. I live within walking distance of any number of marijuana dispensaries, okay? This is like, this is a blue city. I thank goodness I'm not here full time. But at the game last night, I was looking around and like, you know, people were like generally like looking at the flag. A lot of people had their hand over their hearts, you know, which is like what I do during the singing of the national anthem. It, it really actually felt fairly normal. Um, so when I saw this story, I actually did think to myself that, you know what? I mean, sometimes we kind of have to like zap ourselves out of reality and kind of like remind ourselves that like what we see, because, you know, all four of us, like a lot of our listeners or viewers are, you know, as like the kids say, very online, right? We live in kind of like a social media 24 seven cycle. And uh, it, it is kind of easy sometimes, I think, to get a little lost in there um, where we see kind of these blue check marks who are doing this ridiculous stuff. So last night was actually kind of a sobering and somewhat kind of um, uh, calming uh, experience that I had at the, at, at the hockey game. On the other hand here, um, as we've seen time and time again, a lot of like what like the crazy kind of blue checked like journalists, ruling class activist types are doing is oftentimes a leading indicator as to where kind of like the more kind of median uh, left of center person will be, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the line here. So I, I so, so I think there's definitely something here. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, the far left has always hated America. That's not a particularly um, new sentiment, I think. I mean, we literally had people kind of openly siding with the communists and uh, to, to an extent during the Cold War. I mean, I remember when I was a senior in high school in AP government class, you know, when I was kind of the only right of center person arguing against my 25 classmates. I remember this one girl who showed up to class, smart girl who literally wore a hammer and sickle sweater one time. And I looked at her and I was like, this is, I was 18 years old. I said, like, do you know, like the manifest evil that that sweater represents? And she said to me, um, you know what? I think the world probably would have been a better place if America had been tamed in the Cold War. So look, this sentiment is not new. There was a lot of kind of viscerally hostile anti-American sentiment on the left. On the other hand, um, I would just urge a bit of caution to kind of extrapolate too much from this one incident. I don't have much intellectual infrastructure to bring to this conversation other than if you are triggered by the American flag, you probably need to see a therapist (laughs) and that, (laughs) but also like, I think this goes to the fact that like, it should be a requirement for New York times contributors to have to like travel routinely or live somewhere else than their own echo chamber, because this is America. What, what she's witnessing is actually fairly commonplace in America. And I think the flip side of it for us, well, speaking for myself anyway, that lives in a blue bubble, I put up with this everywhere, right? Everybody in my community has all kinds of paraphernalia and flags and signs in their yards. And I mean, am I supposed to be triggered by it? Maybe I'm doing it wrong, but like, this is how it works. And like, I, I do find anecdotally, even my friends on the progressive left are overtly, you know, far more hostile to me sharing my views than I am to theirs. And I think this is almost just a, a dispositional thing between the right and the left that, um, has been written about uh, by Jonathan Haidt 
a number of times, most uh, infamously, I think in his book, The Righteous Mind, which I would encourage listeners to, to read if they haven't, he really gets into this topic. The subtitle is Why Politics and Religion like Divide Good People, and it's worth checking out. And Ben, before we toss to you, I actually want to read another thing, because Josh's point I found, I, I generally agree with, and I find very uplifting. And then Charlotte Clymer jumped into this entire dust up and said, as a military vet veteran, I completely agree with Mara Gay. It is disturbing. Large American flags on trucks are performative nonsense that are absolutely intended to communicate that America is a conservative white country. It's an intentional signal. She's right. Now, I could go on about that for a really long time, but I won't filibuster i'll toss it to you ben i just want to say that it's amazing how people who don't spend enough time with the types of people who would put giant american flags off the back of their truck will read into their motives without literally having any idea what those motives actually are well uh, first to josh's point i mean if you believe as many on the left do that america is an irredeemable evil, deplorable bastion, then of course the symbol of America, our flag is going to be associated with that evil deplorability and if not bigotry and racism. You know, we've talked about Ibram X. Kendi before, and he says we're essentially what white supremacist terrorism is at the heart of the American system. I'm paraphrasing him. So I think this goes along with the line of thinking of Essentially, if you're a patriotic American and you show that visibly, then you are an actual or at least would be or promoter of uh, domestic violent extremism, right wing violent extremism in this country. I think it's perfectly in line with that sort of way of thinking. It's also about smearing and targeting fellow Americans as well to chill them into not wanting to be overtly pro-American. And if you're not pro-American, then what are you doing in this country in the first place? Uh, and and moreover, I, I would really like to know where this was, because I bet you she was out in the Hamptons and she was just appalled <laughs> that she saw that actually in the heart of a Republican congressman, Lee Zeldin's district, that there are actually patriotic Americans out there. But I appreciate the fact that the media is so overt and blatant in their hostility to the American system and trying to make it seem as if the American flag itself is a symbol of evil. I think that's going to backfire on them in spades. So we can take that as a silver lining of all this. It's very important to keep uh, conservatives out of the Hamptons at all costs. <laughs> it's just an unpleasant thing to have to deal with. Well, let's go around the room and get everybody's final thoughts. Um, you know, so much of the themes that we talk about, I think, are have to do or animated by this elite sentiment, right? The, the New York Times, you know, our public health institutions forcing instead of reflecting, I think what they used to reflect was which more, more of a cultural consensus and even a political consensus around key, key questions of self-government. You know, they reflect one view and they enforce it on the rest of us. And I come back to this time and time again, sort of as the right reshapes itself to meet its present threats. You know, I think what really is driving a lot of this realignment is, is the way Josh put it a couple of weeks ago, I think, which is less, I, you know, the scariest phrase in the English language is no longer at every turn, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. It's I'm from the overclass and I'm here to subjugate you, right? And both are equal threats, right? I, I don't think the government is capable, you know, and I, I, I sort of agree with Josh that I'm administrative state suspect in many cases, especially when it colludes with that elite narrative, I think it can do great damage. But I do think more and more the distinctions in our politics and the conflict within our politics is being driven by this power class, this overclass that is just determined to hold on to cultural and political and economic, economic power in the face of millions of citizens who don't want them to have it. And I think this is gonna be the defining narrative of our politics in the next 20 years. Yeah, I can't remember if I've talked about this on a previous NACON squad or previous kind of parting shots, closing thoughts. But, you know, back in January, January was obviously kind of a very kind of tech centric month, given January 6th, given Parler, given all the bands and and, and all that. Um, and I wrote a blog post at the, at the time for uh, the American Compass site. And, and I think I called it um, Reclaim Democracy from Technocracy, I, I think was like the title of the blog post. And what I was thinking here was, um, you know, it's very it's very common in kind of conservative and libertarian circles to talk about kind of uh, Congress's Article One prerogative to kind of reclaim power from the administrative state that over the past hundred years has really seized that power. Uh, you know, folks like Senator Mike Lee are extremely vocal um, about this, um, as they largely should be. Again, I'm you know I'm skeptical of administrative state power for a lot of the reasons that we talk about with respect to the ruling class in particular. 
But, um, you know, I think back and uh, Senator Ben Sass, who's not necessarily probably one of the favorites of, uh, of NatCon squad or, uh, uh, or any of us individually, um, he, he had like a really kind of eloquent maiden Senate floor speech actually years ago that I always kind of quote. And uh, he referred to the quote, symbiotic legislative underreach with respect to the administrative of states. What he's saying is that when Congress fails to actually legislate in its allocated Article 1, Section 8 constitutional ambit and its authority, then the administrative state is naturally kind of, it's going to go into that void, going to go mm-hmm. into that vacuum and, and seize the power. I think, and the, the point is American Compass Blockbuster did was that the point is that I think the big tech companies have done that. They have seen that Congress has actually not has not legislated in this area. They have left this territory completely effectively unregulated, you know, really since the Communications Decency Act of 1996. I mean, there's been really no meaningful kind of antitrust work, at least until kind of the you know, the Google antitrust case, uh, you know, with Bill Barr last year, the last major one obviously was Microsoft, like almost 20 years ago, right? So Congress, and I guess just the government in general has not acted in an industry in a space that has grown, changed, transmogrified, you use whatever word you want to use, that has changed so much over the past 20, 25 years since the relevant legal provisions that actually govern this were drafted. That is a huge problem. So in particular there, when Congress is not stepping up, for example, to kind of actually legislate, it's kind of, it's going to kind of put in like a first amendment or some sort of kind of legal uh, provision with respect to what the social media companies can and cannot do, then they're obviously going to take advantage of it. They're going to do silly crap. And it is crap, silly crap with Will Upton and Mike Davis about like the gimp and Forrest Gump or whatever. So, so um, I, I, I do think the analogy there is worth further exploring. I probably need to write more about that. But the same way I think Congress has not properly legislated and allowed the Ministry of State to come in, so too have they not properly legislated and they've let Silicon Valley, you know, unaccountable tyrants come in. Just an important correction there. I don't believe that the gimp was in Forrest Gump. I believe it was the gimp from Pulp Fiction. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Critical. There's a gimp in Forrest Gump. I, the movie is very different than I remember. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I'm actually, I'm really not a Quentin Tarantino fan, so I, I don't remember Pulp Fiction at all, but that's, that's, that's a story for another day. Uh, ben, will you share your final thoughts on the gimp from Pulp Fiction? <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll take it in a different direction, maybe more of like an inglorious bastards in terms of, uh, t- taking out your perceived political foes, uh, in a, in a completely different direction here. Uh, this week I actually had the opportunity to interview former president Trump, uh, in connection with a book I'm working on, on U S China policy, past, present, and future. And so we got to touch on some of the topics that we discussed uh, during this episode and just briefly on China, a, a couple of points that he instilled during the conversation were first, essentially paraphrasing here, what percentage of Washington is bought off by China in effect or in actuality, which is a large percentage. And in particular, as you might guess, uh, the president believes that he, essentially China has so much information on the Biden family that it's completely compromised, uh, which should give everyone a very pessimistic view as to what the Biden administration is going to do. And I do wonder, this is my editorialization here, but is the Biden administration pursuing lab leak now, in theory at least, to try to provide some cover for all the various ways the administration is going to cave on China Ultimately, we'll have to see how it plays out. And then the other point I'll make briefly, uh, just my takeaway walking away from that interview, was that all the things that we stew over on a weekly basis here, the former President Trump is stewing over as well. I think uh, he's driven mad by the elites who, of course, loathed him and rejected him at every turn and also looked down upon we the people as well. And my observation walking out is that there's almost no way this this man is not running in 2024 uh, to try to avenge what he feels was an election that was ripped away from him. So uh, that, that's my take from that interview. And perhaps I'll be able to divulge more over time uh, as this season of NatCon Squad progresses. <laughs> I'll just quickly add um, a reflection on those those days in the immediate aftermath of the 2016 election were oddly hopeful days for me uh, because not because I was a a huge Trump supporter or because, you know, I mean, I definitely didn't want Hillary, Hillary Clinton to be president under any circumstance, but I did think that like, finally, if the 
the winner or the host of the Celebrity Apprentice defeats the former Secretary of State in a presidential election. Finally, the media will stop, will, will like have to be shaken out of its stupidity. And like, finally, we can burst the elite bubble. Finally, everyone will read coming apart and will reckon with their um, elitism. And that was like incredibly naive. Um, the Mara Gay story, silly as it is, just reminds me of that because to put it in perspective, this is a member of the New York Times editorial board. It is not a blogger for Slate speaking on a random podcast or to a liberal blog. This is, you know, five years after Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton Clinton, um, a former Secretary of State, and she's still talking like that and defending it. The New York Times defended it. It happened on the airwaves of MSNBC. She's being defended by others on the left. And that, as silly as this whole dust up is, it just reminds me of that, like, what animated me to work in this miserable world of politics is that um, I grew up in Wisconsin and just was so sort of upset by the way we were, you know, people like... Um, people like the people I lived around were treated by the media. And I thought, you know, finally in 2016, I was like, well, maybe this, this bubble thing is finally, finally going to pop. And um, this is a sad statement on, I think, the, the devolution. Um, it hasn't gone forward at all. It's actually been two steps backwards. So on that, um, it isn't to say it couldn't change at some point. It's, it certainly can. And, and that's the work that we are up to here. So on behalf of Ben, Rachel, Josh, thanks for tuning in. I'm Emily Jashinsky, and we will see you at the next NatCon Squad.